Hey, welcome to Ones and Zeros. My name's Ben, and today we're going to be taking a look at PWM using STM32 microcontrollers. So PWM, otherwise known as pulse width modulation, is a particular signal that you can generate to be able to do things like controlling the brightness of LEDs, or it's also used to be able to control servo motors, so to be able to control a particular position that you want a servo motor to be in. And today we're going to take a bit of a look at what a PWM signal is, what it kind of looks like, how it works, and then we're going to go through and look at how we go about using the timer peripherals in STM32 microcontrollers to be able to generate PWM signals. And then following that, we're going to go through and write a driver to be able to more dynamically generate uh, PWM style peripherals within the STM32 microcontrollers. So adding that to our Quartz Arp code base that we've been working on through our videos up to this point. So first things first, let's have a bit of a look at what PWM is and how it kind of works. So for that, we're going to jump over to our little setup that we've got here at the moment. So we've got the oscilloscope set up. We've got the Nucleo 64 board that we've been using through a bunch of these videos so far. So that one's just running a STM32F411 microcontroller. And we've got the rotary encoder hooked up to it that we were using during the last video. So just put a bit of an aluminium knob on that one just to make it a bit easier to adjust in this case and then we've also got an led hooked up this blue led here and the, the led the signal that's traveling to the led from the microcontroller we're also splitting that off and capturing that on the oscilloscope so what the led is actually receiving is the same signal that we can actually see on the oscilloscope screen at the moment and what we can see on the screen is actually a pwm signal so the way PWM works is by sending a series of pulses and depending on the width of the pulses determines basically how much power is being sent or in the case of a servo motor, what position we actually want that servo motor to be in. So the way we've got this set up at the moment is so that the rotary encoder is actually allowing us to control the width of the pulses so if we turn this one down we can actually see that the width of the pulses is getting smaller and if you look at the led you'll actually notice that the led is getting a lot dimmer as we turn that one down so we can go all the way down to the point where the led is actually off and if we start to turn that up we'll notice that the pulse width is increasing all the way up to our maximum where the LED is going to be at its brightest. So that's kind of what the signal looks like. Now the actual overall frequency of the pulses can also be varied depending on what we're looking at doing with it. So in the case of say driving an LED having a higher frequency for the the pulse width signal will actually allow the LED to look quite smooth. Whereas if we were to turn it down to say only a handful of pulses per second, then you might actually get to the point where you start to see the LED flickering, which might look a little bit unpleasant. Now in the case of the particular signal that we're using at the moment, if we bring up our cursor, we can actually see that the frequency that we're measuring there is actually 3.85 approximately kilohertz. So rather a high frequency. Um, however, as we'll see when we start to look at a bit of the code, we'll be able to see that we can actually vary that depending on what sort of parameters we're actually giving the timer. So that's kind of what pulse width modulation is, um, is in modulating the width of the pulse. That's basically exactly what it means. So let's get stuck into some code and let's see how we can actually use the timer peripherals in the STM32 to be able to generate those sort of signals for us. 
So let's jump over to this one at the moment. So this is the code um, as it was at the end of our rotary encoders video. Um, and we are actually going to be using the encoder as we just saw to be able to allow us to mess with the, the pulse width modulation a bit as well. So we can also sort of see how the encoder might be used in certain situations. So what we're going to do first up is we're going to run through and similar to what we've done in the rotary encoder video is we're actually going to go through and create some pulse width uh, pulse width modulation set up uh, first up just so that you can kind of see how it's set up and then we'll have a look at going through and getting a driver set up so let's just call this PWM initialization and let's get some stuff happening there so first things first is we are using a GPIO pin to be able to send the PWM signal out of the microcontroller to, in this case, the LED and the oscilloscope. So we've got to set the GPIO up first. So as we've done a bunch of times previously, the very first thing that we're going to need is a GPIO in a type def, which we're going to call GPIO in it and fill that one with zeros and in this case we're going to be using gpio b pin number six for this one so let's set up our pin first up so that'll be gpio pin six our mode because we're using it connected to a peripheral we're going to be using gpio mode af push pull so alternate function push pull we're going to not use our pull up or pull down resistors so there'll be no pull up or pull down on that one our speed for that one will be we might set that to high and the alternate function we're going to be using for this one is going to be gpio af2 timer 4 because it's going to be timer 4 that we're going to use in this case to generate the pwm signal now if you are not sure how to tell which alternate function you're actually going to be using. Uh, we might actually take a quick look at that because I don't believe we've had a look at that in any of our videos up to this point. So if I just find a particular bit of documentation we need for this. Got a massive library of documentation here as well. So, so there's three bits of documentation I've got for this board, which I find extremely use, useful. So we've got the actual Nucleo 64 user manual, um, which gives us a bit of information specific to the Nucleo 64 board. And then for each of the SCM32 devices, you'll typically find these two bits of documentation. So one will be a user manual and the other one will be a reference manual. Uh, the reference manual is also always going to be the larger one, as that one goes into a lot more specifics. Um, in this case, I believe it's going to be the user manual that we're going to want here. So I'll just grab that one, pull up our table of contents, and then we want to go to our pinout and pin descriptions, and to our alternate function mapping table. So on this table, let's just zoom in a little bit here. You'll notice on the left hand side of the columns and this goes across quite a few pages so if we scroll through you'll see all the way up to gpio h and 
across the top, it'll have the particular peripherals. So in this case, we're going to be using GPIO B pin 6. And we can see here that we have timer 4 channel 1. So in this case, we know based on this that we're going to be using alternate function 2 for that. And depending on how you want to set things up or trying to figure out which pins you want to use for particular things, you can go through this table and say if we wanted to have timer one, channel one, we could actually scroll through and have a look here. We can see there's timer one, channel one there. And you'd be able to go through and find that Timer 1 channel 1 can actually be connected to multiple different pins um, depending on what you're, how you want to set it up. So using that you can actually figure out which pins can connect to which components of which peripherals. So that's how that works there. So that's why we've selected AF2 timer 4. And if we right click on this and go to open declaration, we'll actually see that in our HAL GPIO EX.H that you'll actually be able to find the particular definitions for the various alternate functions as well. So that's between that and the documentation allows you to figure out which alternate function you're actually going to be needing to use for a specific pin or a specific peripheral. So now that we've got that set up, we'll go through and initialize that one. So we want GPIO B and pass a pointer to our GPIO init structure. So that's our GPIO setup. The next thing that we want to do is Let's just pop some comments in here. So initialize our GPIO pin, enable our timer clock. For that one, it'll be how RCC timer four clock enable. And again, if we right click that and go open declaration, you'll actually find so that you can go through and find all of the clock enables and disables for the various peripherals as well. And that one's in the HAL RCC EX.h file. And those ones you'll be able to find in the drivers, HAL driver ink uh, folder here. There's basically all of the header files for the HAL. So just in case you're looking for those at any point, so we've got our clock enabled. The next thing that we need to do is go through and actually initialize our timer. So for that one, we're going to need our timer handle. So that will be a timer handle type depth. And let's just call that S timer handle. Need to tell it what instance we're going to be using, and in this case, it's going to be timer four. And we'll fill out the initialization details for that one. So we're going to need to give it a prescaler which in this case, we might go with the same settings that we were using with the oscilloscope before. So we're just gonna make that 100. Need to tell it what the period is for the counter. So how many ticks the counter is gonna count up before it goes back and resets and the prescale is going to define how fast the clock is for the timer and the period is going to determine the overall period of our overall pulse for our PWM signal. So between the two of those, we'll actually determine what frequency our PWM signal is. 
So the larger the numbers that we put in for the prescaler and the period, the lower the frequency we're going to have for our PWM signal, um, or the smaller they are, the higher the frequency we get. Now, the other thing to be aware of there is that the period is also going to determine the granularity of the PWM signal. So how many steps we have to be able to control it from its smallest pulse up to our largest pulse. So in the case of the example we we're looking at at the start, we we're using a period of 256, which basically allows us to have 256 steps of granularity in this case for the brightness of the LED, that means that we get 256 brightness levels effectively that we can go from basically completely dark all the way up to the brightest level. Um, you can make that smaller or you can make that larger, but bear in mind that that's also going to impact the frequency of the PWM signal. And that will also matter in a situation where you're using it to control a servo motor um, because servo motors are typically going to work best in a certain frequency range for the PWM signal. So you may need to adjust your prescaler value to suit a certain period or number of steps that you want. We are also going to do a, a video coming up at some point um, looking at using the PWM to be able to control servo motors specifically. Um, I do have some quite cool Metal Gear servo motors on the way at the moment, which we're going to be using for that. But for the moment, we're just going to be using the controlling the brightness of an LED as our example. So that's our prescaler and our period. We're also going to set our counter mode. In this case, we're just going to tell it that we want it for count up. So that'll be timer counter mode up. And set our clock division. I don't believe the clock division is actually going to have too much impact on what we're using it for in this instance. But we're going to set it anyway, just find it it's handy even if you're not using particular values when you're filling out a structure for initialization it's worth popping them in there simply because it helps lock into your memory what particular settings or items you have to be able to control a particular peripheral And one of the other things we should have done is set that to all zeros as well. It's always a good idea to do that, just so that if there's particular bits of the structure that you're not filling out, then those are basically just going to be filled with zeros, which is generally a bit safer than just having whatever may end up in there based on what was in the RAM that the structure ends up taking up. For our repetition counter we're just going to chuck ff in there and for our auto reload preload we're going to turn that one on so it basically allows preloading of the auto reload register um, which is not something i'm going to go into too much depth with now um, but that is available in the documentation that um, i was talking about before now we're going to use our hal timer pwm init function to be able to initialize this for pwm and pass it the pointer to that timer handle that we've created and in here we're going to go through and if it fails so this should be if it doesn't equal hell okay then i'm going to print a message out via serial just to say that it hasn't worked and 
We'll also do the same as what we normally do, where we turn on our user LED to also act as a bit of an indication for us as well. Let's just check what the name of that is. So that will be GPIO user LED. Set that to on. And if you're curious about how the serial stuff works, um, that is in, I think, episode three and four of our Discovering STM32 series. And as far as the GPIO um, that we're using there, the particular driver that we've written for that, that was in episode two of the Discovering STM32 series. So, and the other thing we're gonna do is if it fails, we're just gonna chuck it into an infinite loop so that it doesn't continue on from that point. And if it succeeds, then we will continue on. Now we're going to initialize our PWM channel. So in the case of timer four, we've actually got four different channels that that timer has built into it. So with the STM32 device that we're using here, timers one through to five all have four channels that they can use and you can have independent pulse width modulation on each of those channels so in the case of this timer we can have four different pwm signals and control them all with a different pwm value even though they will be sharing the same prescaler and period um, timer nine and ten i believe have two channels and timer 11 has one channel so depending on what you want to do and which pins you want to be able to connect to based on the alternate function chart that we looked at, you can use different timers to be able to do that. Now the next thing that we need to do is get that channel set up. So we're going to need a TIMOC init type def to be able to might call that channel in it so fill this one out in order to be able to set up the particular channel for this one and a few details that we're going to need to pop in here for this one so first of those is going to be might help if we put the right thing in there so that will be OC mode and that will be OC mode, and we're going to use PWM1. There is a couple of different modes that are available here. Um, there is the PWM and PWM2 modes. Um, again, sort of explains a little bit better in the documentation for that as well. But for the moment, we're just going to use PWM1 for this one. Try and keep it a little bit simpler rather than going into too much detail. Next item we're going to need is our OC idle state, which in this case we're just going to go with OC idle state set. I'm going to set our pulse to zero. Our OC polarity. Oops. On there, which we're going to set to OC polarity high. And our OC fast mode, which we're going to set to OC fast enable. Now to configure that channel, we're just going to go PAL timer PWM on big channel. We're going to pass it the handle for the timer. So S timer handle. We'll ha pass it the channel initialization structure. And we also need to pass it the particular channel as well. 
which will be timer channel one. And again, we're going to make sure that whether or not that succeeds. And if not, we'll send a message out via serial. And we'll just say channel initialization failed. And turn our user LED on. And pop it into an infinite loop. And if that succeeds, might also, if our normal initialization succeeds, send a message out there as well saying it's initialized and down here we'll do one just saying that the channel initialization has succeeded as well might even just say channel one initialized because that's the particular channel that we're using It's not super necessary to do those particular bits with the serial, but just so that you can sort of get a bit of an example of how that can come in handy for helping to debug the certain things if they fail. So say if we've put a, a dodgy setting in one of our initialization structures here, then we can see straight away that it has failed and by the LED being stuck on, um, that will also give us a quick visual reference looking at the board that something's not behaving as well. So I tend to find that stuff can be quite useful. Now the other thing that we're going to need to do is then basically enable our PWM for that channel. And for that one, we're going to use how timer PWM start, pass it a pointer to our timer handle, and also tell it which channel we're enabling. Now, one thing to be careful of here is say if we're using more than one channel, um, as far as when we go to tell it to start it, if we have a look here, right click on that one and go to open declaration, we can see we've got five defines here. So one for each of the channels individually, and then there's timer channel all. Um, when it comes to using PWM, even if we're using say all four channels or multiple channels, you can't actually use timer channel all when you go to call our PWM start, um, it won't actually work correctly if you do that. So you'll need to go through and either, so say if we were going with timer, uh, channel one and channel two, you should be able to do it, doing it that way. Or alternatively, you can just do multiple calls to start as well and do one for each channel like that. So that's a bit of a workaround there. Now, the other thing that we'll need to do for that is tell it where we want, like what PWM value we want initially. So if we go with L timer set compare, because it's the capture compare register that is actually holding the particular value. And that will be Pass it the timer handle, tell it which channel we're setting. So in this case, it'll be channel one and what our value is. So the particular value we pop in here will be, you'll be wanting to have that in between zero and whatever the period value is that we've set here. So say if we wanted it at um, the pulse to be half the width width of the PWM signal, we could pop say 127 or 128 in there. And that would give us that particular value. 
And I don't believe we've missed anything there. That all looks pretty good at this point. We've enabled our clock, done our GPIO, initialized the timer itself, done the channel to, to start that one, and given it a PWM value to work with. Let's see if that compiles for us. And I think that's probably a first for my streams and videos that it actually compiled first time perfectly. So I'll take that as a bit of a win today. So let's pop that on the device and let's see if that actually wants to work first time. And if we jump over to our screen, we do actually have that giving us the exact signal that we want. So as we can see that for the period of the PWM signal, for half of that, it's giving us a binary one or sitting at 3.3 volts. And for the other half of it, it's sitting at zero volts or a binary zero. So just so that we can see that actually works, if we want to go through and let's just change it so that it's on for a quarter of the time. Just dump that code onto the device. And there we go. So it's on for a quarter of the time. And say if we wanted three quarters, let's try that as well, just to make sure that that's also working correctly. And there we go. So that all works quite nicely for us. So that's how you would go through if you were going to hard code it. Um, now, as I mentioned, we are also going to do go through and actually write a driver for that to work. Um, we're going to be using the timer manager um, that we did in our timer manager video in order for it to be able to make dynamic use of the particular timer peripheral, um, similar to what we've done for our timer interrupt. Uh, video as well as our rotary encoder video that we did last time. So let's close that one. We'll close these couple and we'll close those two. And then we're going to go through and we'll get some files created to be able to pop that driver into and get that one written. Um, but first things first, I'm just going to duck off for a quick bio break and then we'll get that driver done. So I'll be back in a couple of minutes.
and we are back all right so first things first let's get a couple of files created for this one so we're going to just go with qadepwm.hpp and we want a source file for that one as well which will be qad underscore pwm.cpp and we'll go through and copy across our header like so get this guy fixed up and so the first of november here at the moment And as with uh, most of our videos so far, the code, source code for this one will be available on our GitHub, typically within about five to 10 minutes after the end of the stream. So I will be popping links in the description on Twitch and YouTube for this one as well. So it's our PWM driver. Also gonna want our prevent recursive inclusion for this one as well like so copy this across to our source file as well so we'll cpp there we'll get rid of this one and we're going to be wanting to include our header for this. The other thing that we're going to want to include in our header file will be our timer manager as well. All right, so. I'm going to Firstly, pop in a bit of a define. Which will hold the maximum number of PWM channels that we can have. Now, that's also going to be determined by the particular timer that we're using. However, we're going to allow it to be able to store data for up to four PWM channels because that's the maximum number we can have based on the peripherals that we've got. Just pop a comment in there just to help break that up a little bit. Now we're also going to want a init struct for setting this one up. Um, we're going to have a channel init struct and we're also going to have an overall init struct for the whole peripheral as well. So that way we can have an array of the channel init structs inside the overall init struct, which I'll see shortly. Help if we can spell correctly. All right, now the details we're going to want in this one is firstly whether or not that particular channel is active. So we're just going to use our QA active state enum for that one, which we've defined in our setup.hpp file. We're going to need to know what. GPIO we're actually using for that one, so that one there, we're going to want to know which pin we're using from that GPIO and what its alternate function is as well. Now, because we're going to 
use this same init structure init struct to store data for not only when we're initializing it but also within our driver class as well we're going to define a assignment operator in this structure as well so that we can more easily copy that across and that's basically just going to go through and copy the particular bits of data from one to the other or in this case from other into the current one so that will be the active pin and our alternate function as well. Now there is a bug there as well. Ah, because we're using this name inside of the structure and the name's not defined until the end, we're also going to just jump in here and pop the name in here as well, which then fixes up that particular error that we had there. So you'll notice that these guys weren't actually blue and this guy wasn't actually green. It's the easiest way to see that it wasn't understanding what we we're talking about there. Now in our main init struct, we've got to be able to tell it what timer we're going to be using. So use our QAD timer perif enum, which is defined in our timer manager HPP file. So that's that one. And we're also going to want to know what our prescaler and period values are going to be as well. as well as having an array of our channel in its structs to hold the details for the particular channels. We we'll use our QAD PWM channel count definition there to define how many entries we need in that for those channels. So that's those structures done. Now we'll get on to the actual driver class itself just add that in there just to help break things up a little bit and our particular driver class we're just going to call qad underscore pwm again following the conventions that we've been using for the code so far and i'm going to create a enum in here to allow us to define each of our four channels like so We want a private section for storing some of our data and a public section for some of our functions that we're going to need in there as well. So similar to the way we've done a bunch of the drivers so far, we're also going to have a dinit mode enum as well to be able to define whether we want to partially deinitialize so in the case where our initialization fails and we want to partially deinitialize the stuff that we've set up to that point, or if we have successfully initialized it and we've used the driver and then we want to uninitialize it, then we want to perform a full deinitialization as well. So same as you may have seen in some of our videos previously. So we're going to want to be able to track whether 
the driver is currently initialized. So for that, we'll go with a QA init state, which is another one of the ones that we've defined in our setup.hpp and track whether or not the driver is currently active. So again, use the same naming conventions that we've used for a bunch of the other drivers. We'll keep track of which timer we're actually using for this one. And we'll also want a handle for that one. We'll also hang on to what our prescaler and our period is. And we're going to be using our PWM channel in its struct structures to store the data for our channels in here as well. And again, setting how many items in that array using that PWM channel count defined that we did before. And Also going to pop that one in there as well, which we'll come back and sort of explain shortly. All right. Now, as far as constructors and destructors, as we've done a few times previously, we're going to delete our default constructor because we do want to be able to pass the initialization data to the driver that it's going to need to be able to be initialized. So pass a reference to that one. I'm just going to call him S in it. And we're going to go through and to our member initializer list. So our state at this point will be not initialized. Our active state will be currently inactive because we haven't set anything up at this point. We'll copy our timer over from our S init. Fill our handle with all zeros. across our prescaler from our init structure along with our period now a couple of other bits that we're going to set up that we won't be doing specifically in the initializer list is firstly to copy across the data for our channels from our init struct. So it's less than QAD PWM channel counts. So this is why I prefer to use the define for that we've set up up here to define our maximum number of channels because that way we can reuse that in a bunch of different places and rather than hard coding say the number four in all these four places you'd only have to mistype it in one particular place for there then to be a bug now however by using that define it means that there's much much less chance that we're actually going to create a bit of an issue with that one and just going to copy across these from our init struct and that is using i want to pop a, the s in there so that's actually using the assignment operator that we've defined in here is what allows us to do this rather than having to go through and individually 
copy each individual detail so it just makes things a little bit easier and makes the code a little bit neater as well and for our channel select it's basically what allows us to select the particular channels so as we've defined it as we've used here to tell it which channel we're actually using and which channel we're starting PWM for. If we have a look at these values here, you'll see that they're not exactly just a, a 0, 1, 2, 3 value. So in order to make it a bit easier to access those just by indexing into an array is why we're using this channel select. So we can use the PWM channel enum that we've defined to be able to index into that a little bit easier in order to retrieve the value that the hell is going to need depending on which channel we're using. We might actually rename that to make it a little bit more consistent as well. Missing a semicolon there. We'll pop QAD in front of all of these guys. Just so that the naming convention is a bit more consistent, considering that that enum is actually defined. Actually, no, that's defined inside our driver class, so we won't worry about that. If we were defining that enum, say, outside of our class, so say if we were to pop it in here for example, then I'd put the QAD underscore before it just so that it fits the naming convention that we've used for all of the other items and helps avoid potential confusion down the road. So that's all we need to do for our constructor. Now we're also going to have a destructor in here as well. And in this one, it's firstly going to check whether the driver is active. And if it is, it's going to call the stop method, which we'll be defining shortly. And then after that, it's going to check whether or not it's actually initialized. And then if it is, then it will deinitialize it. So that is those ones. And then as far as the particular other methods that we're going to need, we're going to need some initialization methods will be in it which will return a QA result to let us know whether it has succeeded or failed and also going to have a dnup method and we're going to do this similarly to we've done in a bunch of our other drivers as well so we're going to have some perif init and perif dnup methods as well which I'll explain why in a little bit, but you may have also seen in previous videos that we've done as well. And this periphery in it, what method will be the one that takes in our DNA mode enum in order to let it know whether it's going to do a full deinitialization or just a partial one. That should actually be private, like so. Also going to have some control methods, and there's not too many that we're actually going to need for this particular driver. So we're going to have start, stop, and a method to be able to set the PWM value for a particular channel which will take the PWM channel enum to let it know which channel we want to change the value for and a uint16 of the particular value that we actually want to be using for that one. Like so. Now let's copy these guys over to our source file. We'll get these guys fleshed out. and lay out everything consistent with how we've been doing it in our other drivers just so that 
visually the code looks similar, makes it easier to, to read when you're going through it. And there will be private initialization methods because they were defined in a private section of the class. Move those guys across. Now, because the PWM channel enum and the DNF mode enums were defined inside the class, and we're currently doing these in the source file outside of the class definition, we also need to pop this in here so that the compiler knows what those enums actually belong to, otherwise we'd get an error, as well as making sure that all our function definitions have the class in front of it as well, again to keep the compiler happy. Now, at some point I will actually be sitting down and getting a bunch of documentation done for the stuff that we've been creating across the series of videos as well, so that when you go to use it, rather than having to refer back to the videos and watch through them again, um, it'll make it a little bit easier to just go through the documentation and see how a particular driver is used and what the various functions and stuff are actually for. W and Val. That one, and lastly, these two. Excellent. Streams behaving, that's always good to see. All right, let's pop some code into these functions. So first up for our init method, we're first going to check whether or not the timer peripheral that we want to use is busy or not. So just access that from our timer manager use our get state method, tell it which timer we want to use, and then if it passes a value that's not zero, then we know that that's busy. However, if it gives us a value that is zero, then we know that it's not busy, and those are based on these state items in this enum. So that's why we've defined unused as zero and in use as Anything that's not zero allows us to easily go through and just do it like that rather than having to check whether it equals a particular thing. So if that is busy, then we'll return QA error for if busy, which is part of our enums defined in our setup.hpp file. If it's not busy, then we're going to tell the timer manager that we want to register that timer as being used. Tell it which timer and what we're actually going to be using it for. So in this case, telling it that we're going to be using the PWM. And then at this point, we'll go through and call our perif init method. And we're going to store the QA result from that one in eres. So that if 
we have an error during initialization and check eres to check whether or not that's the case and if there was an error then we're going to deregister the timer at this point because we're not actually using it if it hasn't initialized properly so that way we can use it for something else or come back and try and reinitialize it depending on the the code that's using this particular driver for our dinit methods we're first going to check that we are actually initialized so if we're not initialized then we're just going to return because we don't want to try and deinitialize it if we if it's not already initialized and then we'll call our perif dinit method tell it that we want to do a full deinitialization and tell the timer manager that we're no longer using that timer like so so we're going to jump down to our perif init and perif dinit methods we'll get these coded up next so similar to what we did before when we we're just seeing how this all works in our main is this will be where we go through and actually get everything initialized. So first things first, we're going to want to initialize our GPIOs. And in this case, we might be doing more than one depending on how many channels we've actually told it we want to be using. So we'll get our GPIO in a type def. We're not gonna set our pin straight away yet. I'll set our mode. So GPIO mode eight alternate function push pull. No pull up or pull down resistors. And set our speed. And these three items will be common across all of the channels that we're actually going to be setting up. And then we're going to go through and iterate through the data for the four channels or depending on the amount of channels that are available from that timer so we're actually going to check that from our timer manager so it's able to tell us how many channels a particular timer peripheral has so we'll retrieve that from there tell it which timer we're going to be using and it'll return the particular number of channels that that timer has so that way we're not going to be setting up channels that aren't actually available for a particular timer and we're then going to check whether or not we've told it that that particular channel is actually going to be getting used so which was defined in our channel init type init struct which we have right here so it should actually be ms channels might help if I spell that correctly and then for each of these we'll go through and tell it what pin we're going to be using which we've stored in the data for that channel as well as our alternate as well now the reason why we do it this way is because depending on which pins we're using some pins could be on a different gpio so channel one of the timer that we're using could be on say gpio a and then the second channel we might be using from a pin in gpio c something like that so in that case the alternate function is going to differ in between those particular pins potentially and the gpio itself is also going to differ so that's why we go through and set them up similar to this um, we took a similar approach to this with the encoder driver from the last video as well. So tell it which GPIO this particular pin is using, pass it a pointer to the init structure, and that's our GPIO is done. And 
now we'll go through and enable our timer clock and for this one as we've done in the timer interrupt video and the encoder video we just uh, use the timer manager to enable that for us using its enable clock method tell it which timer we want the clock enabled for and it'll take care of that for us Okay, now we'll go through and fill out the details in our handle. So first up, we need to know what instance. Again, something that we can retrieve from the timer manager. We'll use the get instance method from that one. Tell it which timer we want the instance for, and it, it will return that one for us. Set our prescaler which will be stored in MU Prescaler. Set our period, which we've also stored before. Set our counter mode. Block division. Repetition counter. And all, all of these settings are basically the same as what we did earlier. And our auto reload preload, which we will set to enable. And then we'll go through and actually initialize that one. Pass it a pointer to the handle. And then if that doesn't equal hello OK, then we're going to do a partial deinitialization. And return QA fail. Now we're going to go through and initialize our channels. And just use a for loop to iterate through these guys. And retrieve the number of channels that we've got from our timer manager. Check whether or not that particular channel is actually going to be used. What's it not happy with there? Now, oh, might help if we put a semicolon there instead of a comma. Um, we're also going to need a timer OC in a type def set these guys up which we'll just call timer oc in it now we're not going to fill that one with zeros there because we're going to be iterating through multiple channels so we'll actually go and fill that with zeros for each of the channels set our oc mode using the same settings as we were using before. So using PWM for PWM1 for our OC mode. Set our idle state. Set. So let's set our pulse to zero. We see polarity, which will be high. And 
set OC fast to enable and go through and initialize the channel. Pass it a pointer to our timer handle. Pass it a pointer to our OC init struct. And then reference into that array that we created, the channel select array, which then gives us the particular value we need for each channel, as mentioned earlier. And then if that fails, then we're going to do a full deinitialization at that point. And return QA fail. Now the last bits that we need to do in here is we need to set our init state to QA initialized because everything has been set up at that point. And set our active state to inactive. And we've gotten to this point, everything has initialized correctly, which means that we can return QA OK. And for our deinitialization, first we're going to check whether we're doing a full deinitialization. And if we are, then we're going to need to go through and deinitialize the timer, which we can do just by calling hal timer pwm init, passing it the timer handle, which will also go through and deinitialize the channels for us as well. We want to disable the timer clock. So get the timer manager to do that for us. Deinitialize the GPIOs. Again, just use a for loop to iterate through those guys, depending on how many channels the particular timer peripheral has that we're using, and whether that channel is actually being used. Just use the hal gpio d init method for that one and just have to tell it which gpio is being used and what pin in that gpio we are wanting to deinitialize and lastly in that one just need to set the states so our init state at this point will be qa not initialized and our active state will be inactive so that's those bits of there and just got to do our start stop and set pwm value methods and then we can test it out and see how it goes so we'll start and stop um, we could go through and put methods to start and or stop a particular channel. Um, we could add that at a later date. However, for the moment, we're just going to go through and start all of the channels that are being used and then stop all of the channels that are being used. So... Similar to what we've done for our initialization and deinitialization. We're going to go through and iterate through the number of channels that that particular timer has. Check whether or not that channel is actually active. And then if it is, then we will call how timer PWM start for that particular channel. and use our channel select array to reference into the particular 
channel ID that it needs for that. And then at that point, we'll also set our active state to QA active so that we know that that driver is actually active and doing stuff at that point. Um, our stop method is going to be fairly similar. So I'm just going to copy and paste that from there into there. The difference being that we're going to be calling stop there instead of start, but otherwise everything else will be the same for that. And setting our active state to inactive. And lastly for this one, first going to check that our timer actually supports the particular channel that we're trying to set the PWM value for. So say if we were trying to set it to, for channel four on a timer that only has two channels, this is going to prevent it from trying to set that and potentially causing a guessing we'd get a hard fault in that situation because it's trying to access a register that doesn't actually exist. Use our channel select array to tell it which channel and pass it the particular value that we're going to be setting there. And that is that driver. So a little bit simpler than some of the drivers we've done so far. Let's check that that actually builds for us and then we'll go through and give it a bit of a test. Nine errors, not too bad. What have we got here? What's it complaining about there? Some reason our operator is not correct there. It might help if we actually return the value there. Initialize reference member. Uh huh. Okay. That should be a star rather than a reference. That's better. Let's sort of that out. Now, some errors in here. Let's see what we've got. I believe that should be get channels. That looks better. It should actually be uval rather than eval because it's an unsigned integer. Fix up its definition as well. That's a bit better. Get rid of that underscore. Let's fix that one up. And what have we messed up here? Uh, missing an S. Like so. All right, zero errors, zero warnings. So let's go through and comment out the initialization for this stuff. So 
still going to want to keep our encoder there because we're going to use that to help change our PWM value. Some stage we'll go through and clean up some of this temporary code, but I'm I'm leaving this stuff in. So for our external interrupt and our timer interrupt and things like that in the code for the moment so that you can sort of see a bit of an example of how those drivers are actually getting used. Um, however, we'll go through and clean that up at a bit of a later date. And so we're going to use our actual encoder update here to help set our PWM value as well. However, first up, to test the driver, we're going to need to pop that include in there and be pwm underscore test and we'll go through and get that one initialized we might do that after our encoder we might move this stuff down a little bit here this in after our encoder so it's all kind of together now we're going to need a less pwm driver testing need a pwm init struct And as we did before, we're going to use timer four for this one. QAD timer four. Use the same prescalar and period values that we used for testing before as well, so that you should get the same results. So that was 100 and 256 and set up our channel so we're only going to use one channel at this point same as what we did before so for that channel we need to tell it that it's going to be active we need to tell it what gpio we're using in this case gpio b tell it what pin we're using so that was gpio pin 6 and what our alternate function is which is gpio af2 timer 4 and we'll also just let it know that the other three channels of that timer are not being used And just fix up our array indexes there. That's all we need to do there. And then we can go PWM test equals new QW, QAD PWM. Copies wearing off. PWM tests initialize that. And then if it's initialized or if it if it's failed, so if it's failed, it'll return a value that is non-zero or true. And we'll pop a message out saying initialization failed. Turn on our user LED and jump into an infinite while loop. If it has succeeded, then we will go through and start that one. And pop a message out via serial to say that 
PWM is initialized and started. Now, down in our processing loop, we're just going to create a, let's make an int 32t, and we'll call that, it's not unsigned, it's signed, so it'll be IPWM val. And then in our encoder update, rather than actually sending our encoder value out by serial, There we go, IPWM val plus equals our encoder value. We might start our value at 128, so it's in the middle. And then it'll add whatever value we get from the encoder. So if it's positive, it'll increase. If it's negative, it'll decrease. And then... might actually check with our encoder want the encoder in linear mode rather than exponential mode so let's change that not that it matters it just means that it changes how much it will accelerate depending on how quickly we turn the encoder but but what we want to do linear will actually give us a slightly better feel um, but to prevent us from having to turn it a whole bunch to get from the minimum to the maximum we might just multiply that encoder value by four and then we'll also want to check because we need a value that's in between 0 and 255 based on the period value that we've given that timer. So if it's less than 0, we'll make it equal to 0. And if it's greater than 255, we'll make it equal to 255. And then we can just go through and set the PWM value tell it which channel we want to set that for so we'll use that enum that's a member of the pwm driver and provide it the particular value and let's see if that wants to build wonderful let's pop that on to our device and see how we go Now, the other thing we might just do is previously our encoder was updating every second. So let's change it so that it updates 20 times a second just so that we get a nice smooth feel from our encoder when we go to adjust it. And jump over to our device, which is just uploading the code now and we are downloaded and there we go if we adjust our encoder let's get the encoder in the shot as well along with our led so we can see as we turn the encoder go all the way down to zero and the LED goes out and see the signal on the oscilloscope and then if we turn it up we can see the brightness of the LED increase and we can see because we're getting it to update that one 20 times a second we get a nice smooth feel as we adjust the encoder which is nice and fluid and thus we have a PWM driver so hope you've enjoyed that one. Um, that one's nice and simple. 
if you've got any questions or comments or anything like that, definitely love to hear about them. Um, feel free to leave them on Twitch or YouTube. You can also jump onto our subreddit, so r slash ones and zeros, and leave a comment on there. I'd love it if you um, join the subreddit as well. That would be awesome. And you can also email us on the onesandzeros.contact at gmail.com, which is currently showing on the screen. Um, definitely love all the feedback. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, we'd love it if you followed. And if you're watching on YouTube, we'd love it if you liked and subscribed. Definitely means a lot. And thank you to all of the people that have subscribed and followed recently. Definitely really awesome to see that some people are really enjoying the stuff that we're putting out. Um, and if you do want to help the channel moving forward, then we do also have the Patreon, which is showing up on the screen at the moment as well, down there. Um, which is patreon.com ones and uh, slash ones and zeros. Um, does also help with us moving forward with getting new devices and things like that to be able to show you guys and do code with and things like that. There has been a couple of hundred dollars worth of stuff which has been ordered in the last couple of days, which will be being used in future videos, including some uh, CAN transceivers because we've got some i2c spy and can videos which will be coming up soon um some servo stuff which will be following on from this particular video so we'll be adding to our pwm driver and showing how we can do various things with servos um making those nice and easy to be able to use if you're using those to to control things and there's also some new development boards and stuff which are on the way as well. So I've had a bit of a look at some of the development boards which are more easily available at the moment because obviously given the chip shortage, uh, prices for certain things have gone up and certain devices are really hard to get hold of at the moment. So had a bit of a look through to see which ones are slightly more affordable and a little bit easier to get your hands on. So we've got some of those guys on the way, which we'll be writing up code bases for, um, specifically some F4 discovery boards and some F1 boards to some blue pills, which are on the way. And there will also be some stuff being given away when we hit 100 subscribers on YouTube as well. So that stuff has been ordered and is on the way. So if you want to potentially get your hands on a free STM32 board, definitely help share our YouTube channel, get some more people subscribed to that, and details will be coming up on how you can possibly get your hands on some free stuff. Um, we'll be paying for shipping and all of that sort of stuff too, so it's going to cost you zero dollars to have something show up at your house that you can write code for and mess around with, which I think is kind of exciting. So going to be looking at giving away stuff as we reach each of the milestones that we're setting as far as subscribers and stuff like that. Um, thank you again. Hope you really enjoyed it and hope you have a lovely day or evening or night or whatever it is where you are. Thanks for watching.